Welcome to the Kerry Newhoff Leadership Podcast on YouTube. In this episode, we hope to help you thrive in life and leadership. And I want to tell you about two things before we dive in. First of all, how is your team culture? You know, my friends at Leader have an assessment for you to really tell whether your employees are engaged or not. You can check it out at leader.com slash culture. That's L-E-A-D-R dot com slash culture. Just click the link. And I've got something for you called the Preaching Cheat Sheet. I've been communicating, preaching, giving keynote talks for over 30 years. And there's a hard way to do it and an easy way to do it. And I can't do the hard work of coming up with great content, but I can show you how to do it better faster and far more efficiently so that you can really focus on what matters. I've got 10 steps inside the cheat sheet that will help you get to a great talk faster starting right now. You can just click on the link or go to preachingcheatsheet.com. That's preachingcheatsheet.com. And now to today's episode. Well, welcome to the podcast, Megan, for the first time. And Mike, welcome back. It's good to have you both. Thanks, Carrie. Thanks, Carrie. We're so glad to be here. Well, I'm really glad you're here too. We're going to talk about a number of things. We're going to talk about mindset because I think leaders have been through mind games like none other over the last three or four years. So I want to get to that. But you have been through, your company has been through a really big transition in the last couple of years. Uh, As we were talking about before we hit record, they almost never go well. This one appears to have gone quite well. And I would love for you to fill us in a little bit. Well, let me start because I've been a part of those transitions that didn't go so well. Okay. So um, the the biggest, ugliest one in my experience was when I became the CEO of Thomas Nelson Publishers. Mm. And I can tell this story now because my predecessor has uh, gone on to his rest. And, uh-huh. you know, he was my biggest supporter, super um, helpful, a mentor, recommended me to the board to be the next CEO. But uh, we were a public company at the time, and the board voted unanimously to make me the CEO. And the next day, the former CEO, this was Sam Moore, just to use a name, um, he, he walked into our offices to our CFO, and he said, Joe, if I'm not the CEO, who am I? And that was a a fundamental question of identity. Mm -hmm. And so for him, because he'd been the CEO for literally 50 years, his identity was so wrapped up in his role that he couldn't differentiate between the two. Mm. And so he just felt like he was out there on thin ice. He didn't have any place to land. He hadn't given really any thought to what he was going to do in terms of once he handed over, you know, the the mantle to me, what what was he going to do next? He hadn't given that any thought. So literally Carrie for two years, um, he tried to unseat me and get his job back. And so this was all happening behind the scenes. He was calling my competitors, trying to, to hire other CEOs to, you know, try to come in and take my place, which as a board member, he literally couldn't do it as a public company. It was really a mess. But thankfully, I had the, the unanimous support of the board and they supported me through that. But it was really awkward because I had to shield the employees from all this stuff that was going on behind the curtain because, you know, he was revered and I didn't want him mm. to be you know, I didn't want his reputation to take a ding. And so I was trying to protect both him and protect the team from him. And so it was very stressful and it was a big job for me. And I was trying to get my own sea legs. And so it was, it was challenging. So I thought, I don't want to do that again, ever. Well, I wish I'd never heard that story before. Unfortunately, I think it happens a lot, like the whole identity. And I, I want to get in to that a, a little bit more. Megan, I mean, you're the new CEO of Full Focus, and we'll talk about the whole company transition along the way as well. Um, fill us in a little bit about the transition that you and your dad have done over the last couple of years. Yeah. So it really was a almost five-year process in mm-hmm. the making. And I think that's a big secret to the success of our succession transition is that Long before it ever happened, we were talking really openly and really deeply about the transition at a practical level. You know, for example, what would I need to learn to be prepared for that? Those kinds of things. 
but then also more at an existential level of what was next for my dad and what was he looking forward to and what was he afraid of and and vice versa. And I, I think that that was really helpful because it enabled us to work through all that instead of it being on the back end, it was on the front end. And I think the nature of our relationship as being very open and collaborative and high trust set the stage for a great transition. But I also have to say, and you know, my dad won't say this of himself, but his humility and his courage in that process, I think were uh, unusual contributors to the success uh, of the transition because he was willing, one, to not see himself as the only person that could lead the company, which I think holds a lot of founders back and a lot of CEOs that need to make that transition is sort of thinking, I'm the only one that could ever do this. You know, all the best ideas are, are for me. And I think he's just collaborative by nature. Um, but then I think he also took a, a brave look at his future and started to think about what could be next and how might he want to contribute on, if he wasn't going to contribute operationally to the business, how else would he want to contribute? And he really had to think through that and kind of work through the challenge emotions that can come as a part of that. And I think a lot of people just avoid that altogether. It sort of becomes, you know, this whole existential threat of your mortality and nobody wants to face that. And that's a big challenge. And in our case, um, that wasn't a part of it. So we worked through that for several years. I was the COO for a number of years at really incubating the CEO position. And that was intentionally a part of the strategy that um, that we came up with. And then in 2021, January, 2021, I stepped into this role. And it's so funny because if you had been a fly on the wall or if you had asked our team, they would have been like, transition, what transition? You know, it was so, <laughs> it, it was so happened. natural at that point. It was just like one more step. It wasn't a big leap. Um, even though it probably seemed like a big deal on the outside, it was really not a big deal on the inside because of all that preparation. I'd love to ask you a little bit more about identity, Michael, because, um, I don't think your predecessor was alone. And I imagine you probably had some moments where you were like, what am I doing? And when I stepped out of the lead pastor role at the church I founded back in 2015, uh, I thought I was good. I got a lot of counseling, a lot of mentoring. But then I realized, wow, there really is a lot of my identity tied up in that. But I had this to go to. So I think it was an unfair test. Like, I think like maybe one day I won't be doing, you know, quote, anything in the future. How did did that play out in your life? Well, I mean, this sounds maybe trite or maybe formulaic, but, you know, obviously as a Christian, my identity is in Christ. Sure. You know, let's start with that. And I'm not saying my predecessors wasn't. And I do think it takes a little bit more of that in terms of implementing it. But, uh, but that's where I started, you know, that I'm a whole person in who I am. I don't need my company to make me whole. I don't need my work to make me whole. And I think that another thing is, you know, one of the things that we're all about at the full, at full focus is something we call the double win, which means to win at work and succeed at life. And one of the things that we advocate for is that you have, have to have work life integration. Hmm. There has to be more to your life than just work. The problem is, is that for the generation that my predecessor grew up in, work was pretty much everything. You know, that was the number one thing and everything else took second fiddle. And I've known lots of pastors that have had the same regard. You know, they'll quote the Bible verse, you know, he who does not hate his father and mother and so forth is not worthy of me. And that's their license to put, you know, the church and their ministry above everything else. And so for me, I've got five grown daughters that I dearly love and all of them live within 30 minutes of me. Mm. And I have 10 grandchildren, all of them. Megan has five of them, so she's got the bulk of them. <laughs> yeah. But they all live within five minutes of my house. Wow. And so I have a rich, full life apart from my work. And my work's very important to me, yeah. and it's meaningful. But I think that, that it's a real danger for a leader to build their life on one of those domains of life and not be able to have kind of um, the resilience of having multiple domains that they're working on. And, you know, there's, there's times when my marriage is not as, not to the place where I'd like it to be. And yeah. same thing with my relationship with kids and all that, but I'm working on all of it all the time. Hmm. That's the totality of my life. And that's my identity, not just what I do at work. You're, you're extremely driven though. And, uh, you know, I mean, I followed you, you were saying I've been following you for probably a dozen years or so. It might even be a little bit. No, it's probably even longer than that, to be honest with you. And you've got this deep drive and a lot of founders don't know what to do with that when they step back. 
Was there a wrestling? Was it a gradual thing? Yeah, you've got this meta vision, like, you know, the double win and integrate work and life, and you got to have goals beyond that. But I'm just wondering whether there was, uh, you know, a couple of twists in the road or anything like that that you ran into. Well, let's start with the fact that I'm the adult child of an alcoholic father. Okay. And so in my background, it was pretty chaotic. Mm. And so I can remember one time when I was 18 years old, I was still in high school. I was a senior in high school. My sister was 16. We came home from a party. We weren't Christians. Our family wasn't a Christian family. We came home from a party. Our friends dropped us off on the curb, but they didn't leave right away. But we noticed immediately our dad had passed out drunk on the sidewalk. Mm. And so we were mortified. We were so embarrassed with our friends. And we went and, you know, picked him up. And my, my sister ran into a room crying. And I stood in the shadows. And I can remember thinking to myself, I will never be like that. Wow. I will make something of myself. Mm. And so there was this drive to not be my dad. There was this drive to establish order over chaos. Mm. There was this drive toward achievement. You know, I don't know if if that was because I'm an Enneagram three or that turned me into an Enneagram three. You know, I'm not quite sure how all that works, but I'm definitely achievement oriented. My top uh, strength on strength finders is achievement. But this all came to a crisis in about 2003. So 20 years ago. So I was working at Thomas Nelson Publishers. I was managing one of our divisions. That division was dead last in every metric imaginable. That's how I got it. That's how it was handed to me. And so I didn't fully realize that when I took the job, but I quickly surmised that we were in deep trouble unless something changed. So I went over, went out and kind of cobbled together an offsite, uh, a vision of where I wanted to take this division. And I told the CEO it would take about three years to turn the division around. And I had no idea, Kerry, what I was talking about. I had yeah. no idea how long it would take, but he wanted a number. And so I gave him one. And I thought I allowed myself plenty of buffer. Long story short, in 18 months, we went from number 14 in revenue growth to number one. Number one in profitability. Number one in employee satisfaction. Every metric possible. I got promoted from there. So that, that first, uh, when we first turned the business around, and we completed that first 12 month cycle. I got the biggest bonus check I'd ever received in my life. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was bigger than my annual salary. Wow. I could not believe it. And I could not wait to get home to show it to Gail, my wife. I've been married now to her for 44 years. But at the time, I, th- I thought she's going to be, she's going to go crazy. She's going to flip out over this. So I got home and I showed it to her, and she kind of was nonplussed. Huh. And she's very positive. She's like a cheerleader, so encouraging. And so she said, you know, honey, I, I so appreciate everything you do for us. And I, and I love you, you know, to the moon and back, but we got to talk. And so I thought, whoa, what's up? So she said, let's go sit down in the den. And we did. And she, she started to tear up a little bit. She said, you know, she said, um, here's reality. You're never here. Mm. I mean, never. Mm. And even when you are, you're not fully present. Yep. Your head's always somewhere else. And, and this is a time when your daughters need you now more than ever. Mm. And then she started to cry. And she said, if I'm honest, I feel like a single mom. Mm. And that gutted me. I mean, I, that was not what I was going for. Mm. And it was a huge wake-up call. And I, you know, at that, at that point, business coaching, life coaching was kind of a new thing. And nobody really heard of it. But, but I... I called John Maxwell, who was one of my authors that I was publishing and and a friend of mine. And I said, look, I didn't tell him the whole story. I was a little bit too embarrassed by what had just happened. But I said, I think I need a business coach or a life coach or something. He said, I know just a guy. And so he hooked me up with somebody. And so that was Daniel Harkavy of Building Champions. And he said to me in the first call, he said, well, tell me about your life. And I said, well, I basically work as long as I need to work to get the job done. And he said, so you don't quit. I said, no, I usually go home at the end of the day, have a quick dinner with my family, uh, prop open my laptop and get back to work. And I, he said, what about the weekends? I said, yeah, I usually work through the weekends, at least Saturday morning and Sunday night. He said, what about vacations? And I said, well, I'm always up Mm -hmm. early in the morning going through email while, you know, the family's still sleeping. And frankly, my head's not in the game for the vacation because I'm dealing with stuff back at work. He said, would you be willing to put boundaries around your work. And I said, what do you mean? He said, is there a set time that you would commit to me that you'd be willing to quit at night and not pick up your laptop again? So I took a deep breath and I said, yes, 6 p.m. Hmm. He said, okay. He said, I don't care what it is. I just want you to have a boundary. He said, are you willing to not work weekends? And I said, yes. 
He said, are you willing to not work uh, vacations? And I said, yes. And then this was a kicker. He said that I suppose you won't mind if I call Gail periodically to check in on how you're doing. <laughs> and he did. He called her several times, which really kept me honest in the process. But it had to come to a crisis. Yeah. And, and I think when we, we call that the impossible choice. Mm. You know, is it going to be your, your career? You know, if you're going to really make a dent in the u- universe, do you have to be like Elon Musk and work 120 hours a week? Mm-hmm. Or are you going to apply the ambition break and throttle back your own aspirations for the sake of your family and your health and all that. I felt like it was kind of a false dichotomy. I, th- I thought, what if there's a third way where you could win at work and succeed at life? And that's really what I spent really the next 15 years trying to figure out. Totally. How could you do both? Wow. Megan, uh, you know, what was that season like for you? I'm sure you have memories of it. Your dad before that moment in 2003 and your experience of your dad since then over the last 20, 20 years. What, what did that feel like for you as a daughter? Yeah. Well, so, Don't make me cry. I know. Mm. <laughs> it's going to be an Oprah <laughs> moment here. I can feel it coming. Um, you know, I'm the oldest of yeah. five kids. So at this point, I'm in high school, uh, really, and kind of at the end of high school. And I think it was simultaneously two things. You know, my dad and I had always been close. We had always just naturally connected. Um, So much of uh, my success at this point is because of his investment in me personally and professionally. And like the first business trip I ever went to was a Christian Booksellers Association conference when I was eight years old with my little Hmm. frilly socks and my little dress. And I went and sat in the meetings with him, you know, and I loved it. So there was that part. But then there was the other part of just the sadness of, I wanted more of him than I got. Mm -hmm. I wanted him Mm -hmm. to come to my school things, not just my mom, you know, and, and they kind of had a division of labor where anything kid related was moms and anything, you know, providing for the family related was dads. And it was just like a real clear line. And so there was definitely something missing. And it, I, I think it felt, um, like I was competing for his attention, which I didn't, I didn't like, you know, and I think my sisters would probably say something similar. And so, you know, part of the great thing about being the oldest is I got to see that transformation firsthand. You know, I didn't maybe benefit from it in my growing up years, like some of my younger sisters did because they were at home longer than I was, but I got to have a front row seat to what the before and after was like. Mm -hmm. And to see my dad, you know, create a life plan and create a a vision for his life and his uh, career. And ultimately later, you know, for a number of different businesses that aligned with his most important values, which didn't really happen in the earlier part of my life was, was pretty compelling. And I think ended up inspiring my own story. Um, you know, where my husband and I have five children, I'm married into two, and then we adopted two boys from Uganda in 2011. And then, um, four years ago, adopted a a baby domestically and our middle boys came home with a ton of trauma and they needed to have a really present, uh, set of parents to enable them to heal and to move on. At that time, our business is taking off. You know, now at that point, I'm working with my dad inside what was formerly Michael Hyatt and Company, now now called Full Focus. And mm. I had to make a choice of, as I was stepping into that COO role, how am I going to do this? And I had in the background of my mind, my experience growing up of the before and after of my dad. And so I knew that it was possible to set boundaries on your work and still achieve big things. And so when my dad came to me and said, um, you know, can you become the COO? I really think that's our next step. And we started kind of thinking about the succession and all that. This is actually even before that five-year period that I talked about. I said, yeah, but I need to be done every day at three o'clock because I've got to pick my kids up from school. Frankly, mm. childcare is not an option for them. They need me and I'm not going to be able to do, do stuff at nights or on the weekend, except occasionally, you know, I really have got to be home when I'm home and I got to be at work when I'm at work. And to his credit, he said, you know, if you can, if you can deliver the results in that period of time, you know, what I, that's what I care about. I don't care about how long mm. you're quote unquote on the clock. And so that really um, gave me extraordinary freedom to, again, not compromise the business results, but also not compromise my family in the process. And I don't know that I would have had the framework for doing that had I not gone through the difficulty of seeing the workaholism and then the kind of turnaround and redemption of that. And I don't, you know, I think about his life and, and what, um, what our work is able to do in the lives of other people who come to us. We have clients all the time who come to us who are working 70, 80, 90 hours a week. And, and they are able to find a path toward this double win that would never have been possible if his story hadn't played out like it did. So from my perspective, nothing's wasted. 
Michael, I just want to say I really appreciate you going there and opening up the conversation. I had my moment, not in 2003, but 2006, where my workaholism got called out and my family paid a huge price. And when I'm mm-hmm. sitting around mm-hmm. with my sons, it's still emotional for me. Mm-hmm. Not, not me really too. for them, but it's still really emotional for me. And I want to pick up because you're talking to tens of thousands of leaders right now who just got owned and maybe are still opening the laptop past six o'clock or on vacations or finishing that message on a Sunday morning or getting ready for the week on a Sunday night and who really don't have boundaries. I want to drill down with both of you on the do less, accomplish more paradigm, which I know is out there. Everybody's heard it. This is not news, but I think workaholics don't believe that it works. So if you would talk about life and and Megan, I'm very interested because I had a three o'clock, a 3.30 cutoff Mm -hmm. at one point in my life because my wife was working. I was a pastor's salary. So we had two incomes. She's a pharmacist and a lawyer. So at times one season she was in pharmacy, another she was in law. But it's like, if I don't get home by 3.45, uh, they're going to call children's aid right. on me. You know, like there's going to be some sad kids on the front porch. There's going to be some sad kids and I'm going to jail or something yeah. like that. I would walk out of meetings yeah. at three o'clock or yeah. hang up the phone and just go, I got to go mm-hmm. or child services is coming to my house. Mm-hmm. And I don't think I lost anything. And it, it, you could argue you gain, but for people, and I'd say the majority probably still don't understand how that works and I'm still trying to get my head around it. What... What are the benefits? Like what, how is that paradox actually true? And what did you yeah. discover after you implemented it? Well, first of all, it's not magic. It's not like we have some secret formula for how you can magically fit 70 hours mm. of work into 40 or something like that. You know, that, right. I think that's where people are, are thinking to themselves, there's no way this can be true because it seems like that's what you're saying. And I'm smart enough to do the math and that math doesn't work. Really right. what you, when we say you're going to, achieve more, but do less, uh, or really in our, in our world by doing less, what we mean is you're going to achieve bigger results by doing fewer things to accomplish those results. And I think that's an Mm -hmm. important distinction. It's not about accomplishing the same amount of tasks in less time. And basically I think that's kind of the fallacy of productivity is just how do we get this all to go faster, which is exhausting. And there's really no end to it because then you just put more stuff on it. It's really about the process of gaining clarity around what is my unique contribution to the results that I'm responsible for and also what's going to drive results in general. You know, what are the high leverage activities that I can do that disproportionately uh, drive return on investment? And when you get clarity on that, then the time doesn't really matter. You know, you can you can do it in less time. There's such a, a um, phenomenon right now, and there's been some amazing research. Actually, my dad and I were just talking about this before we got on around the four day work week, and that's not what we do at mm-hmm. our company, but it's something we're certainly open to considering. And one of the interesting things about the studies on that is that it actually drives net income increase in companies. So even when they're decreasing purposefully the amount of time that their employees are working. The, the, the well-being, the uh, work-life balance that their employees have, the creativity and innovation that they can come to the table with because they're rested creates bigger results. And I think that's pretty compelling. And I think that's what we found in our business. To me, this is not about um, just advocating for better work-life balance. It's really a performance strategy. And if you mm-hmm. want to make your highest and best contribution like never before, putting constraints will force you to make better decisions with how you invest your time uh, and really bring a lot of clarity to what you're investing in. Where When you have, uh, you know, totally open-ended edges on your day, you don't have to have those conversations with yourself. Mm. And you can end up spending tons of time on things that ultimately are not driving results or that someone else could do. And so a lot of our work centers around that. Mm. Super helpful and clarifying. Mike, how about you? What, what, what were some of the big aha moments as you went from that always on to here are my boundaries and obviously accomplishing even more? Yeah. Well, you know, Parkinson's law says the work expands to the time allotted for it. Yep. And I sometimes jokingly call this Hyatt's corollary, which is work mm-hmm. contracts to the time allotted for it. True. And so one of the things that happens with boundaries, it's kind of like if you're going to go on a one-week vacation to a destination you really don't want to miss, that Friday before you leave, 
you're uber productive because you've got a hard stop and you don't have time to mess around. Uh-huh. And so one of the things that happened to me was when I put those boundaries um, on my work day I, and I realized that I couldn't work in the evening, that I really had to focus. I couldn't say in the middle of the afternoon, like, well, you know, I'm not quite done, but no problem. I can, I can do this tonight or I can do that mm-hmm. this weekend. That was off the table. So I had to, to, to force myself to, to focus on those high leverage activities. And I think one of the things I realized, Carrie, is that not all work is created equal. Mm-hmm. There's some work that's frankly busy work. Yeah. You know, we, we do it because we have this psychological need to be busy. You know, maybe it's our own anxiety about the future. And this is one of the ways that we deal with anxiety. Maybe it's because we're an adult child of an alco- uh, alcoholic parent. Mm. You know, maybe it's something else that, that forces us to work. And I'll tell you, one of the things that, that I think is, is a big factor is that when we're at work, more often than not, we can measure the results. Yeah. And we're, when we're at home and we're dealing with unruly kids and in a relationship with somebody that's not us and they just, you know, they don't think like us, they may be the, the exact opposite of us because opposites attract, that takes work and it takes long work over years and you don't see the results and the fruit of that for a long time. So it's just easier to say, you know, I got to go to work. You know, mm-hmm. I, I've got things I got to do and you make Done excuses it. for yourself. Yep. And I lied to my wife for years. I didn't know I was lying because it made sense to me. It's just like, babe, I got I to gotta be doing this thing. You know, this really requires my, but, and I convinced myself that the situation was temporary. And, and so I'd say, you know, as soon as I can replace this director of marketing, then things will normalize and I can give you and the girls the time you need and deserve. Or, or once I get acclimated to this promotion, I'll mm-hmm. give you and the girls the time and attention you need and deserve. But the problem is you string those temporary situations, one of them bleeds into another, and pretty soon it's a life like that. And we, it's self-deception. And at some point, we have to just take a hard look in the mirror or the, a hard look in the eyes of our spouse who lovingly confronts us and just say, something's got to change because what I'm doing now is not sustainable and it's going to lead to a bad end. Mm. You know, that's so good. And life is longer than you think it is. I don't know, you know, but when you're in your 40s, you're like, oh, this is a zero-sum game. And then you get a little bit older and you're like, it's a long runway, man. Like, there's a lot more to life than just the last quarter. Got a pace. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, um, obviously, you have a relationship that allowed you to work together and now enable a succession plan. Megan, from where you're sitting, um, talk about some of the, the the good decisions you made along the way to facilitate the uh, the succession, and then maybe some of the surprises, good or bad, that yeah. happened along the way as well. Well, I think the biggest thing is that we did and do invest in our relationship. You know, we have lunch mm. together every Monday. And I look forward to it every week. Um, sometimes we talk about business. Sometimes we don't. Uh, usually <laughs> it's in there a little bit. Um, but we do prioritize our relationship and we prioritize good communication. And so what that looks like practically is that in a succession, there's a lot to figure out about, okay, what, you know, for the person who is being succeeded, you know, how, how are they involved or no longer involved in decisions? When do they need to be consulted? You know, what do they want to have their hands in still? And all that kind of has to be negotiated. And a lot of times you try to foresee that. And I think we really did, but there are times when, uh, you know, I might make a decision that my dad wished I would have consulted him on for, for whatever reason, or Mm. he gets involved in something that I wish he wouldn't, you know, and thankfully those have been few and far between because we did a lot of communicating on the front end about it, but they do happen from time to time and probably happened more frequently, you know, right after the transition happened. And I think that we have both done a good job of quote unquote, keeping short accounts with each other. We talk about it, you know, I'll just call him up or he'll call me up. If there's a problem about something, we're both willing to be wrong. We're both willing to grow and and learn from mistakes. And I think we also assume the best about each other. And so that keeps us from having sort of this laundry list of offenses that were small, but all of a sudden, you know, mounted to the point that they kind of, it's like water in a bucket, you know, kind of overflowed. I don't think we have those moments. And I'm really thankful for that um, in our partnership. And then I think that 
Um, my dad has done a great job. It, it even happened today. We were talking about something when he was here for this offsite um, of believing in me and communicating his confidence in my leadership and really backing me, whether it's with the team or uh, just just wherever, you know, in my own confidence. And that's meant a lot too, because I think he, he's got his own way of doing things and he might do things differently than I do. And, and yet he doesn't, uh, he's not controlling. He doesn't try to dictate those things. And he really wants to be a cheerleader for me while he's also coaching and mentoring me. And I think that um, that's been super helpful for us. So from my perspective, the communication is so critical. And then when you can have the, um, the, the person who is being uh, succeeded really be the champion of the successor and mean it and mean it for the long haul, which is very different than his past experience uh, at Thomas Nelson, that goes a long way to making this work. And I think finding that balance of being the cheerleader, but not interfering in a way that undermines that leadership. I mean, that that takes a lot of sophistication uh, and maturity. And thankfully, he's done a great job of that. Can I just say something, Carrie, related to that? You know, I think my view of leadership has had to evolve. And I think early in my career, uh, and this was back when, you know, Peter Drucker was like the biggest name yeah. in leadership and management, but everything was sort of framed up as management, mm. you know, not even leadership, management. And that was kind of the command and control model, you know, monitor and correct and all the rest. And then, then there were other people that came along, maybe uh, Jim Collins, maybe John Maxwell that talked about leadership, Seth Godin, the difference between management and leadership. And so I moved into that, you know, being sort of that visionary leader that could articulate the destination and inspire the team and get everybody aligned and get them to execute and move towards that. But I really think there's a stage above that and it's being a coach. Mm. And I think that to be able to um, coach the leaders on your team, uh, and I think that, that there are a lot of leaders that if people aren't performing, they say, well, get somebody else. You know, mm -hmm. and they go through a lot of people, mm -hmm. but oh, the real yeah. superpower, the really, I think the thing to develop that, that takes you to the next level as a leader is when you can take sort of the raw material of humanity that walks in your front door to work in your company or your church or your organization and develop that. And to me, fundamentally, that is an issue of stewardship. Mm -hmm. You know, for me, being a steward means that first of all, everything's on loan from God yeah. and ultimately I will return it to him. Everything's temporary, but the key is, I've got to return it in better shape than I found it. And so that requires coaching. It requires personal development. And that's so much more economically viable. You know, it's a, it's a lot cheaper and better to do that than to just keep running through people, hoping that you find that unicorn that can do everything right. Yeah. You know, and so often when you fire one person and hire somebody else, you're basically just trading one set of problems for another set of problems. Hmm? But when you develop people and see yourself a coach as a coach, it's a, it's a big deal. Uh, I really see that as parenting too. Mm -hmm. You know, I saw in, you know, that the goal of parenting was to de-parent, to get my children able to survive and thrive in a world without my constant involvement. And that meant that I had to progressively let go. And so now I see myself with my kids, Megan, you can tell me if this is right or not, but I'd like to think that I'm more of a trusted advisor mm -hmm. and friend and coach. You know, I'm not, I'm, I can no longer, you know, command and control or get them to do what I want or correct them. I don't try to do that. They've got their own lives, you know, but I'm a coach and I have to treat them with the same respect and dignity that I treat one of my coaching clients. Yeah. I, I appreciate you saying that. And I think that's very true. Although I think every founder and every former CEO lead pastor has opinions. It's not like, okay, right. here's the magic day where all of a sudden I'm the founder and you're the CEO and your brain turns off. And you no longer think about the company. You no longer have opinions. And that's one of the hardest things to navigate. It looks like it's gone quite well. But what do you do in those moments where you're thinking, Mike, okay, I'm not sure Megan's making the right call or if our company only did this. Like, I see this opportunity. Nobody else sees it. Uh, but you're like, yeah, that's not my job right now. What goes on in, first of all, can you relate to that? And secondly, what goes on inside you to modulate that? Well, I'm enormously opinionated. Uh-huh. And, and that coupled with a lot of experience is a dangerous combination. Yeah. But I think that's where, 
you, you really have to be self-aware in your thinking and apply some humility and realize that there's more than one way to accomplish something. Mm-hmm. And maybe Megan will do something that's, that's not the way I would do it, but that doesn't mean it's the wrong way. It's just a different way. Mm-hmm. And as long as she gets the result, I don't care. So I kind of have to have the self-talk to myself that, look, how she gets it done is her business. I'm holding her accountable for the results. And if I intervene at every juncture or I insist on my way, then all of a sudden we have two skippers on the boat mm-hmm. and who's going to be responsible if it doesn't work. And so I'd rather have one person responsible. And I think of myself almost as reporting to her, you know, in a sense, I don't want to do things in the company without her permission. So I think, I think the humility part, you know, is a big, is a big part of that. Be humble enough to realize that there's more than one way, you know, to get to the destination than the way that worked for you in probably a different context a long time ago. It may not work today. Megan, what's your take on that? How, how do you, I'm, I'm sure you have things you want to say as well that probably are not appropriate. <laughs> yeah. Well, first of all, because our communication is good, you know, I can say to him, like he got involved in something recently that felt like it was going to be a good thing for him to be, it was something operational, but that he was going to be, you know, helpful with at the beginning. And then as time went on, I realized, oh, this is not helpful. This is actually unintentionally, like he and I weren't necessarily conscious of it, but it was undermining some other people that actually had responsibility for this project. And he just had a unique expertise in this area. And so it was like, great, this will, this will be awesome. And I had to go to him last week and say, you know, dad, I've, I've been thinking about this and these issues have come up and I've got to ask you to step back from this now, not because you don't know what you're doing, you do, but it's, it's because of who you are it's actually too much power. Like it, it's too much horsepower here. And it takes power away from the other people in a way that's disempowering and ultimately is going to undermine what we're committed to with this project. And I know, I knew that he and I were aligned on that, the outcome that we wanted. And, you know, that doesn't happen very often, but I, I've had to do it a few times, you know, to just say, mm-hmm. hey, I don't think this is working like what we thought or like what you hoped it would. And so I need you, I need you to take your opinion, you know, outside on this one. Um, and on the other, on the other hand, I, I'm, tr- I try to be good about asking for his input and feedback where I know it's going to be useful. And I, to me, the, the difference maker is where that those opinions or where that feedback happens. If it happens in a one-on-one conversation with us, it's great. There's no problem. Mm -hmm. If it happens where like he doesn't come to our executive team meetings anymore, but if we, if he did, or if you were in some context where, you know, I had my executive team and and he and I are both there and he disagrees with me and proposes a totally different solution in front of them. And now they have to choose who are we going to go with? That would be a really bad setup. And thankfully that's not happening, but I think those would be some real pitfalls. It's not so much what you contribute, it's where and how you do it. And I think that uh, that can make all the difference. Michael, what's your role in the company right now? Um, How would you define it? Well, I think, um, first of all, content creation, content delivery, and then some limited coaching. So um, I have a few clients that I work with and I, we have a quarterly group coaching program called Business Accelerator, also includes one-on-one coaching. And uh, so I'll usually speak at that quarterly coaching intensive is what we call it. And then I do a little bit of coaching with one-on-one clients, but, but yeah, it's very defined. And we have a whole framework for that called the freedom compass where your passion and your proficiency come together. We call that your desire zone. And it's really good if everybody in the company knows what their desire zone is so they can stay in their lane. And our theory is, or our, our premise is that we do our best work when those two things are aligned. Mm-hmm. And so I know what my lane is. And if it's something else that I'm getting out of my lane, and I won't do it unless I'm invited to do it by somebody else. I may offer, but I, I often, we're often as founders unconscious of this authority that we carry. Mm-hmm. And so I'll have to remind people that, look, what I'm suggesting to you right now, I'm not speaking as a founder. I'm speaking as a peer and I'm just throwing an idea out there and it won't hurt my feelings if, if you guys think this is bad. Because honestly, I have 10 ideas a day. And nine of them don't survive 24 hours with me. <laughs> yeah. You know, I get, I'm cold in, in 24 hours. So if the team activated on every idea I threw out, and if I didn't exercise some discipline in keeping some of those things to myself and let them, you know, marinate for a while, it, the team would just be going off in a thousand different directions. And, and I know that. 
So, um, and, and again, I just, I want Megan to lead. I don't want anyone to ever wonder who's in charge because that's her. Hmm. Any uh, final advice on succession for leaders who are listening, who may be in your shoes, Michael, or your shoes, Megan? Um, Cause it goes both ways. Hmm. Yeah. I think you've got to talk about it, you know, and if you're in my seat, that's difficult if the other person doesn't want to talk about it, which we have heard from so many of our clients and others, you know, kind of in our, our world that oftentimes what happens is, uh, you know, the founder doesn't want to talk about it. I can think of a situation right now that's like this, where everybody knows, but the founder, it's time to move on, but he doesn't have a a vision of his future that's bigger and more exciting than what he would be leaving behind and consequently um, just can't, doesn't have the courage to make that jump because it's it's a perceived loss instead of a perceived gain. And so uh, I think that's, that's a big thing on the founder side, but the conversations, the more candid, the more open they are, the better. And then those need to con- continue through the transition and depending on what the nature of the relationship is, if, if the founder uh, is still the owner, then probably need to continue afterward, you know? And I think that's, that has been our secret to success is really open communication and a lot of trust. My advice, and I do give this to, to founders many times is Dan Sullivan says, you got to make your future bigger than your past. Mm. Uh, another way to say it is that your current behavior is going to be in, either informed by a memory of the past or a vision of the future. And so initially when we started talking about succession, you know, I was all for it because of all the reasons I, I shared about Thomas Nelson and my negative experience. But then as I began to reflect on it, I kind of got scared. And I thought, wait a second, what am I going to be giving up? Yep. And so I was totally focused on the past, what I was going to be losing. And it wasn't until I pivoted to the future and asked myself the question of what is this going to make possible for me in the future so that I can make a, even a bigger, better contribution in the future? Because I really don't believe that it's helpful if we think our best days are behind us. You know, I, th- I think that, that if we're still on earth, if we're still breathing, God's not done. And in fact, our most important work may still be ahead of us. So that's once I made that pivot and started to embrace that, and it got really practical because I listed on a piece of paper, I just said, look, you know, what is this going to make possible for me? I went through the exercise. I took about an hour and I wrote down all the things. Then I was excited about it. And in fact, Megan didn't say this part of the story, but I, I had taken a 90-day sabbatical kind of to stress test the company and to see how it would do without me and let Megan run it. But I did that exercise. And when I came out of that exercise, I called Megan and I said, let's move the timetable up a year. You're ready. I'm ready. I'm ready to get on to the next thing, you know, and you're ready to take the reins. So let's do it. She said, yes. So we did it. Some good practices here. Well, I do want to spend some time on your new book, uh, Mind Your Mindset. It's about uh, the science that shows success starts with your thinking. And kind of if you look at what you do, what I do, what a lot of people who listen to this podcast do, we're in our heads. We basically live by our words, right? What do you do? You have physical products, the whole thing with the full, used to be the Michael Hyatt company, now full focus. I mean, yeah, you have physical products, but really you're playing with your brain. You're playing with your imagination. So it's our greatest tool and also our greatest enemy. And if I was just reading today, like you look at mental health stats now, particularly with Gen Z, it's off the charts, off the charts. So uh, let's start here. Why did you pick this subject? Mm. Well, I think in a way it's the prequel to all of our other work. You know, so much of what we are coming to people with, particularly um, people who consider themselves to be growth minded and, you know, they probably got too much on their plate, but they have big things that they want to accomplish. What we're proposing, whether we're talking about productivity strategies or leadership strategies or goal achievement strategies or strategies for, for small business owners, are a paradigm shift. You know, we're, we're yeah. basically saying you can do this thing that seems impossible uh, if, you do, if you do it this way. And in order for people to even open their mind to that, this idea of, for example, the double win, winning at work and succeeding at life and not choosing between your professional success and your, and your personal success, that requires a certain mindset and it requires a certain um, awareness of what's happening in your own head if you're going to ultimately get a very different kind of results. Because what we know about the brain is that 
what we believe, the stories that we're telling ourselves, we call them narratives in Mind Your Mindset, really uh, kind of predispose our brain to a certain set of actions, which ultimately lead to the results that we're getting in our life. And so if you don't like the results, you know, for example, you're working too much or uh, something in your business or your ministry or your organization isn't going the way you'd like, all of us are, are wired, especially in a Western culture, if you're an achiever at all, just action, right? What different actions do I need to take? The problem is those actions come from our thoughts. And so the real secret to success is having intentional thoughts that cue your brain up to find the kind of solutions that ultimately are going to lead to the results you want. And so we felt like we needed to kind of back up a few steps and take people back to the beginning upstream uh, so that they could really change their mindset to really implement the strategies that we teach most effectively. How has mindset shown up as a significant factor in each of your lives? Michael, for you, we touched on it a little bit. There was that huge paradigm shift, but I'm sure it never stops, right? Like you're always retraining oh. your mind. So how? Uh, give us a couple of examples of how this would be a regular moment for you in your life, an old mindset, new mindset? Well, I, I would say that, first of all, um, being self-aware as a leader about our thinking is most of the game because your thinking wow. is 90% of the results you get. Mm -hmm. And so whenever I'm not getting a result that I don't want to go back to my thinking. So this could have been a whole thing we, we talked about, but um, I had a heart attack in September of last yeah, year. I'm so sorry to hear that. And so happy to see you're doing well. I remember when well, you shared you. that. Yeah. It, it was like most adversities in life. It turned out being a gift. You know, it's, uh -huh. it's like, you know, thankfully I survived it, but um, I went through rehab. So cardiac rehab is a thing that you have to do when you go through a cardi cardiac event like that to kind of get your strength back and monitored exercise, make sure you don't kill yourself in, in trying to get better. And so I remember in the, the first cardiac rehab session, we did exercise and then we got in a room and there was some education, an educational component. And the nurse that was leading it, the first thing she said was she said, what does your heart attack mean to you? Hmm. Great question. And yeah. I, as a coach, I loved it. So the guy right across from me said, well, it means A, my best days are over. B, I'm on the downhill side. And, you know, it's just, it's just going to be, you know, I don't know if it's going to be short or if it's going to be a long, but it's going to be basically, I'm going to be going downhill from here to the end. And I thought, wow. Yeah. And so I had the good fortune of my doctor saying to me when I was in the hospital, he said, look, I know how you've taken care of yourself. You know, you've been really vigilant about your nutrition and your exercise. And this was a genetic, genetic thing that was kind of out of the blue. But he said, it's going to be really easy for you to focus on the past, you know, the land of coulda, woulda, shoulda. You know, you should have done this, you could have done that. But he said, that's the past. You can't change it. He said, this is like a reboot. He said, you're going to be in better health 12 months from now than you've ever been in your life because you've got these blockages cleared up. You know, you're going to be reinvigorated. And he said, I can't wait to see what you do next. So that has a huge implications. That mindset versus the guy, the, the patient that was sitting across the table from me. Because if you really feel like that uh, a decline is inevitable, why even try? Why even exercise? Who cares what you eat? But on my side of it, with my doctor coaching me, I felt like my whole future's in front of me. I got to take care of myself. You know, huh. I, I, I still want to accomplish big things in the world. So it's, it's those little moments like that to be self-aware of the thinking. And one of the ways that in my coaching clients that I try to access it is I listen to their language. So their language will reveal their thinking. And so if somebody says to me, for example, um, well, I'm just not good with technology. Right. Well, that's a story that they've told themselves, probably based on a limited fact set. And so I'll just repeat it back to them. You just said, you're not good with technology. Is that helpful? You know, and just to try to unpack that with them where they can take that sort of uh, limiting belief and transform it into a liberating truth. They may not be good with technology, but the truth is they can learn technology. They can grow in their awareness of technology. And so, you know, it's, it's those kinds of everyday shifts when you're not getting the result or when you think there's a barrier. More often than not, 
It's only in your head. And I never say that because it sounds a little bit condescending, but often it's in our heads. And if we can clear that up, we can get a breakthrough. Well, the book is so much more than that, but I remember when the pandemic hit and, you know, a lot of us, I do a lot of speaking and I had a hundred thousand miles of trips lined Mm. up for 2020 and the world shuts down literally en route to Australia. I was two days away from flying out to Australia for a cross country speaking tour world shuts down. And you've talked about this for years, Michael, and I believe it's in the book because I I think I saw it there. Um, It's the question, what does this make possible? Right. Which is so, and I just went back to that and I gave you credit, shared it with leaders. What does this make possible? Because one way you can say, wow, I just lost all this money. I lost all these opportunities. I had a book launching later, you know, the next year. Wow. This is a disaster. Or, and you know what we did? We thought of some new things. And within a week, we had replaced the revenue I lost. And we had the the best year we'd ever had to date. Mm. It was it was incredible. Um, but it's all question asking. For you, Megan, how has this shown up in your own life? Like your mindset, negative yeah. versus positive. And I, I, again, yeah, I want to be careful with cliches because what you're writing and what you're arguing, I, I said to you, there's a, like, there's a lot of mindset books. I get a lot mm-hmm. of books sent to me. Yours has actual really helpful research in it. Yeah. So congratulations. Yeah, thank but you. Take it, take it where you want. But how, how has this impacted your life? Well, that was really important to us because we had experienced the same thing. You know, this is a topic yeah. that matters a lot to us, has been very personally impactful, but a lot of what has been written is not rooted in the science. And it turns out there is mm-hmm. actually great science to support yeah. mindset. This is not some kind of woo-woo practice. Uh, what we now know about the brain confirms what many people have thought all along. And so um, that's exciting to me. So thank you for for pointing that out. Mm. Uh, you know, I think one of the biggest things with this topic of mindset is this awareness that my dad was talking about between there's what happens in our lives that could be in a police report or a medical report, truly the facts that anybody off the street would agree on. And then there's what we say about what happened. And that's the narrative part or the story part that our brain layers on top to make sense of what we've experienced because our, our brain is a meaning maker. It likes certainty and it likes to understand what happens because it would rather have uh, any answer, even if it's wrong, than no answer at all. It does not like mm-hmm. liminal space. Um, in my own story, when I was probably 16 or 17 years old, uh, I was in high school and I was um, watching a friend deliver a presentation in front of the class. And she became overwhelmed with anxiety, kind of a panic attack, I think, mid presentation and ran out of the room, the auditorium, into the bathroom. And I found her in there kind of, you know, curled up in the fetal position, crying and just totally humiliated. And so, you know, what happened is she had an anxiety attack. She ran out of the room. My brain unconsciously, and this is kind of how these stories tend to burrow themselves in our brain. My brain said, ooh, speaking is dangerous. Speaking could lead to total humiliation. You could lose control of your body. You should avoid this at all costs. Now, I wasn't conscious of that happening, but over time, what, what became, you know, the actions that followed were to avoid speaking, you know, no matter if it was literally speaking in front of a crowd or it got to the place where even my small group uh, Bible study, I didn't want to read passages of scripture out loud because I was so uncomfortable uh, with my voice out loud. I mean, it really became kind of absurd. And so this is now, you know, in my twenties and then in my thirties, uh, a lot of professional opportunities I just passed on, you know, it's like, we need you to make this presentation to the board. Well, let's let this guy do it instead. You know, I, I think I've got some other stuff that day or whatever, just really undercutting myself all along the way. And finally, fast forward, uh, to, uh, my time here at full focus, it, you know, I, th- I think I was the COO at this point already. And my team came to me and they said, it's the funniest thing. You know, we wanted this big conference this summer and we, we don't, we've never had you keynote, you know, I don't know why, but we just never had you keynote. And I'm thinking, this is my worst nightmare, you know, speaking in public, you know, and, and this, the person's telling me we're probably going to have about 800 people at this event. It's going to be amazing. And I'm, I'm just like, oh my gosh. And so that was my a uh, fork in the road moment. I ended up uh, on the phone or rather texting um, a friend who's a speech coach and just saying, I'm not willing to live small, to play small anymore. I'm finally, I've got to confront this story. I've got to look it in the eye. And if it kills me, 
I'm going to get on that stage in front of 800 people and at least not die. You know, that was my low bar moment. And so I had about six weeks of preparation before the event. I hired a speech coach, an anxiety coach, a life coach. I had medication for anxiety from my doctor, but I was determined. And I literally rewrote the story of what speaking meant and what it would be like to step on stage. And it wasn't like, I'm a TEDx speaker. You know, that's not what I was saying to myself. It was things like, uh, you know, I deserve to take up space on the stage and I have something important to say to the people that will be there and they need to hear what I have to say and I'm I'm going to connect with them. You know, I I was just literally rewriting it and I read it every day for six weeks. Sound check the day before I had a total panic attack, like literally a panic attack, hyperventilated. The next day was the day to, to do the event. Got up in front of 800 people was awesome. I loved it. I had a great time. Mm. And, uh, and that's really was, that was, you know, like guerrilla mindset work was what that was because I had this story that told me it felt very true that this speaking thing was dangerous. And I knew that I wasn't going to be able to continue with my career unless I faced that demon and finally, you know, over, overcame it. And so, uh, I, I worked on the story and, you know, now, in some version or another, I speak all the time. um, And I'm so thankful for these tools that we really talk about in Mind Your Mindset because it changed my life. The stories we tell ourselves are pretty incredible. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. if you listened to, if we took that internal narrative and just put it out there for people to see, we'd say, wow, who told you that stuff? Yeah. Right? Like you have terrible friends. Yeah. You need new friends. It's like, no, wait a minute. That was me. That was me. Um, you you do make the link and I appreciate the research in it between how we think neuroplasticity and future outcomes. Can you tell us, because we've learned so much about the brain in the last 25 years, stuff nobody knew. Uh, the way God wired us, I think we're all coming from a, a faith perspective on that. What is it about how we think neuroplasticity and talk to the 60 year old leader who's like too late for me, that guy at, uh, at your rehab, you know, how do you I'd tell a guy like him who's basically waiting to die that he's got to change his mindset? Cause there is neuroplasticity, right? Absolutely. I mean, we've got billions of neurons in our brain mm-hmm. with trillions of connections. You know, in fact, part of the research we have in the book is that we have more connections between our ears than the, than the entire world wide web. Wow. And there's a lot of different ways to connect those neurons together. But we've all heard this uh, phrase that the neurons that fire together wire together. And so what happens is as we make stories and as we repeat those stories, then it's like a groove being cut in a record. For those of you who yeah. remember or are into vinyl records, it just cuts the it cuts that groove deeper and deeper and deeper. So in order to rewire your brain, you've got to have new neural connections. And as you said, Carrie, the, the, the brain is wonderfully plastic, which means it's moldable, it's shapeable. We can think new thoughts. We can take those thoughts like Megan had, where speaking is dangerous, and you can cut a new groove where it, it means to you now, speaking is an opportunity. You know, speaking is an, an opportunity to contribute, to make a difference, to put a dent in the universe, so to speak. So um, I, I think that that's, that's what we've got to realize about the, drain, the brain. And God has made us, you know, wonderful in that way. You know, we are fearfully and wonderfully made. And one of the things that's fearful and wonderful is our brain because there's so much capacity. And for anybody that's studied it, we're just scraping the surface of what's possible. But that rewiring can really happen. And part of the book in Mind Your Mindset that we try to do is to provide the practical tools to enable people to, first of all, identify those neural pathways, and then to be able to cut a new neural pathway that better serves what they're about and what they're trying to accomplish in the world. And what I Can love about us? that, yeah. I, I was just going to say, what, what yeah. I love about getting clear on what are the stories you're telling, and that's really step one in Mind Your Mindset, is identify the story that you're telling, um, is that we don't ask you to just leapfrog to kind of telling some, you know, rah-rah affirmation story, like I'm a TEDx speaker, you know, if you're afraid of speaking yeah. like I was, because your your brain is going to dismiss that. Your brain is going to say, yeah, right, you know? Um, so step two in our process is to interrogate the story. And this is one of those things that, most of us were never taught to do. We probably haven't seen somebody else do, but 
to, to identify, here's the story I'm telling, and then start to loosen the connective tissue between what were the facts versus my interpretation or my story about the facts and what else could be true? What might other people think? Uh, what might somebody else in a very similar situation have come to believe that would be different than this? And you kind of have to prime your brain to be prepared to accept the final step of, of our work, which is to imagine a better story so that when you give that to your brain and you work to um, cut those grooves, you know, build those new neural pathways, it's not immediately rejected because it seems like such a jump. And so um, for those of you who are skeptics who are listening and, you, you know, you're thinking, yeah, well, I just can't tell myself, you know, how great I am and I'll, I'll believe that. That's right. You kind of have to go through a process of, of loosening up those, those connections between the facts and, and the fiction before you can ultimately adopt something better. But then it really is possible and you can actually train that storytelling mechanism in your brain, which we call in Mind Your Mindset, the narrator. narrator. You really can mm -hmm. train that narrator in a way. I just got a new puppy two days ago and you know I'm working with that puppy on all of his obedience commands that he learned at the trainer because we just want to reinforce those pathways. And our brains are very similar to that. Hmm. So is it a little bit like, um, I know I've heard it described as discovering the lie. So for example, mm. part of my workaholism was a performance addiction. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. Michael, you touched on it. Like, yeah, you get respect and raises at work and at home it's take out the trash, right? Like that's, so it's easier to keep working. It's easier uh, to do that kind of thing. And home obviously is a lot better than that, but it's easy to fall into that trap. And for me, I had to understand uh, and this was so helpful for me that when I was young, I confused performance with love mm. that mm -hmm. when I do well, I am loved. And of course that wasn't true. My parents didn't really operate that way. Uh, God doesn't operate that way. My faith doesn't operate that way. My marriage doesn't, but I had misdiagnosed how that works. Once I untangled that and that was counseling and therapy, it became much easier to say, I can close the laptop. I can take a day off. I need a hobby. Um, is it similar to that or, or nuance it? Feel free to take it in whatever road you want. I love that because I think that what great therapy does and a great coach will do, whether it's a life coach or a business coach mm -hmm. or some combination of the two, is they really act as interrogators of our narratives. And uh -huh. they help us. We talk about this in Mind Your Mindset, that sometimes there are new thoughts that we can't think for ourselves. You know, because of our history, True. oftentimes these lies, as, as you describe them, get um, kind of born out of trauma or loss or some, some kind of pain. And so they feel very true. And that's where we can use other people. And sometimes this is a friend or a spouse even, but somebody outside of ourselves can see the lies that we're telling ourselves in ways that are difficult to see ourselves because they feel so true. And I think thinking about it like lies is helpful because those are oftentimes the most insidious and the most powerful uh, in terms of directing our behavior that ultimately drives the results we're getting. And sometimes it's a little shift, Carrie. Yeah. For example, um, I can remember, this is probably about 10 years ago, I just started the company and I really wanted to be out speaking. That was primarily the way I was driving cash flow. And so I had just sat down on an airplane and we were still at the gate and a friend of mine called and he said, Hey, what you doing? And I said, well, I have to go to San Diego to, to give a speech. And this is where my friend interrogated my response and, and our language is access to our thinking. And so he said, wait a second, you just said you have to go to San Diego to give a speech. He said, it seems to me like you get to go to San Diego because San Diego is amazing, number one. It is. And number two, this is what you said you wanted to do all your life. You're living your dream. So you don't have to go anywhere. Nobody held a gun to your head. You get to go. Well, now, whenever I'm faced with something that I chose, I say I get to. Mm -hmm. And that little shift, one word, makes all the difference in how I approach it. That's another Michael Hyattism I have adopted and give you credit for often because I'll hear people that are close to me say, oh, we have to go to so-and-so's so -and -so's house for Thanksgiving or whatever. I'm like, no, you don't. You get to go. Or at least you <laughs> chose, right? You chose to go. Mm -hmm. You made that decision. Own it. And if you find yourself in a place going... I have to go, it really surrenders agency yes. to everybody else, right? It's like, yes. actually, you made that decision. Maybe right now you're not enjoying it. I get to go feels like a stretch. Maybe you need to reevaluate 
your criteria, right? So Absolutely. so good. Hey, the book, anything else you want to say on mindset before we wrap up? I would encourage people. It's a great book. Congratulations. Thank you. I think if you're struggling in any area of your life where you're not getting the results you want, whether mm-hmm. it's your health, your marriage, your business, your ministry, any other area, I think the first place to look is how am I thinking about this? What is the story that I'm telling me, myself about this? And interrogate that story and see if you could imagine a better story because the story is going to inform the actions and the actions will deliver the results. So you've got to get upstream to the thinking if you're going to make a meaningful change in the results. Megan, anything else? I think this can be the difference maker for people. You know, I think that if you're an achiever of any type, you probably are used to the brute force method of just double down and work harder. And that's the secret. And oftentimes the real secret is to go further upstream. And that can be a lot easier and a lot more profound in its impact. And this is an amazing tool to have in your toolbox, especially if you're a leader. So the book is called Mind Your Mindset, widely available everywhere. And where can people track with you each uh, these days and Full Focus online? Our site is fullfocus.co, and you can find everything about, you know, we have two different podcasts that our, Mm -hmm. our company does. We've got blog posts, we've got our courses, we've got the books, we've got our coaching program. Everything is right there. That's great. Thank you both so much. Thanks for having us, Carrie. Carrie.